From the heights of New York City, welcome to Inwood Artworks On Air. It's where we meet the musicians, filmmakers, writers, theater makers, and artists of all stripes who make their home in what we affectionately call Upstate Manhattan. I'm Aaron Sims. I'm Jonathan Bell. And this is Live and Local. It's our podcast dedicated to showcasing the musicians of Upper Manhattan. We talk to them about what they do, and best of all, listen to them perform live in one of our favorite local venues. Today, we are excited to welcome Grammy-nominated Cuban pianist and composer Manuel Valera. Manuel was born in Havana, Cuba, and since 2000, he's lived in New York City, where he attended New School University. His playing is influenced by Bill Evans, Chick Corea, and Keith Jarrett. And he has worked extensively in many groups, including those of Daphnis Prieto, Arturo Sandoval, and Paquito de Rivera. In 2005, Manuel released his first CD as leader called Forma Nueva, and followed that up with a myriad of records, and we'll just mention a few of them, Historia, Melancholia, Vientos, and Currents. After taking a hiatus as a leader to focus on his sideman work, in 2012, Valera released New Cuban Express, a big band album which earned him a nomination for a 2013 Grammy Award in the category of Best Latin Jazz Album. We are thrilled to have him here today with us on Live and Local, and without further ado, let's listen to Manuel Valera.
That was fantastic, Manuel. Thank you so much for being with us here today. How you been? I've been, I've been well. Great. Very good. Uh, would you mind telling us, please, what you just play, played for us? Uh, that first composition I played was a composition that I recorded on one of my new Cuban Express records, and it's called Expectativas. And, and the second one was an improvised piece. You know, uh, many things give me inspiration, you know, the plays, the piano. The uh, the walk around here, which is amazing. I've never yeah. been in this part of the neighborhood. Um, you know, just making some music. I I I've always enjoyed just playing improvised uh, music. Kind of gives me a kind of like a blank canvas kind of thing, and you just make something up. It's always fun. Yeah, you get to react what's around you right now yeah. and kind of be, make it really fresh to you in this in the surrounding. Yeah, well, that's very interesting. That uh, so um, just to clarify. Not that you weren't clear, but for me, um, that second piece was um, a improvisation. When I hear that, I know that can mean a million different things based on how people construct their improvisations. Mm -hmm. So um, I have some questions for sure about the first piece, but now that you have revealed that the second piece was an improvisation, um, could you, um, first of all, it's beautiful. Uh, very different than the first one in terms of mood, become pensive. Mm -hmm. um, before I go further, because I have my own thoughts about what seems to be the what holds together your pieces a little bit mm -hmm. in terms of form, uh, could you talk a little bit about um, how w what it is that you sort of establish up front and before you go sort of into more of the exploration? Right. <clears throat> well, I mean, I think the uh, on that one, I kind of found this relationship between... I guess it was if you want to be, if you want to get technical, it sure. was C minor and A flat minor. I thought uh, there was a third. You know, yeah, and then yeah. and then I started kind of like messing around with the pedal points, putting mm -hmm. A flat minor over C minor, and vice versa. And then it kind of developed into other stuff. You know, it's just how improvised music kind of. And you were th you were playing around with that A flat minor C minor before we started recording. Right. I heard so that was something. Was that something that you were hearing like as you came over here or you were sitting wait like I'm just as a pianist I'm just curious how that happens for for different people. Um I mean I, I just sat down at the piano I kind of played this chord okay. and All right. I kind of decided for the chord and you know kind of, kind of tried to put it back together and take it apart you know okay. that kind of You're kind working of on your new TikTok song that's what it <laughs> was. <laughs> that too. Uh, 15 second song. That's right. Okay. Well see I guess I guess uh, um, again, I may be way off base here, but there seemed to be something similar between your second piece and the first piece. Well, it should in the sense that it's you, you know, but it's similar in the sense of I felt like um, the germ of both pieces began with sort of this uh, axis between a couple chords. Yeah. And then as opposed to sort of a real like... Uh, series of changes type verse right. type form it was more like a germ of a sort of basing on a, a juxtaposition between one two or three chords and then kind of going into different venturing into some, the second one well both i yeah, felt both. like even the first one had that had something similar in that sense i think that the first one uh, the first one also has a similar in the right. valley relationship between the chords yeah. Where it started with E minor and C minor. See, that's what I thought. And I was, yeah. But but the the first one is way more structured and it goes right. into other places. And, Absolutely. And it's um. And that was for your big band? No, that, that, well, was, that no. was for uh, my small group. It's okay. called New Cuban Express. Okay. Um. Yeah. The the I think I think I got that 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 idea of um. I mean, I, I've used it in a couple of my compositions in the past, and that, I think that comes from a Ravel um, string quartet okay. or something like that. Which that harmonic? Yeah, the, the harmonic yeah. movement. Okay, right. Uh -huh. um, but you know, it's, I, I, there's also some some Steve Coleman stuff that I have studied with with yeah. um, negative harmony and right. Like it kind of goes down the the harmonic the uh, harmonic cycle going down mm -hmm. instead of going up. It's a, it's an right. interesting concept, but it, it it also involves a lot of the minor third, I mean major third movement. Right. Which then you get into the whole thing with Coltrane and Janis Steps. And, right, right. I mean, it's 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 been used. You know that that major third movement right. is is used a lot. And I I find that I find a kind of um, I can find myself in 
in in in that in in that kind of uh, interbalic uh, right. connection within the, within the same chords. Right. Um, but you know, just for for starting something like I played this chord, like I said, like when we were kind of when I was just uh, warming up, and it seemed like something that mm -hmm. I could develop into something. Yeah. So I kind of made like a mental yeah. note. Well, it's interesting too. If jump on it really quick. The fact that you bring up Ravel, and then also Steve Coleman, and also of course you know, show, you know, a nod to Chick Corea, he just passed, mm -hmm. you know, recently, but all these things, there's, your world is this really interesting blend to my ear of a lot of um, classical, like mm -hmm. late chromatic type classical, yeah. late romantic chromaticism and, and modern jazz. For sure. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit maybe about um, those influences and that, that hybrid? A, a lot. I mean, I mean, I have a, a lot of influences just because I mean, I come from Cuba, so I have a whole world of Cuban music that influences me. I have the jazz world and jazz pianists and jazz composers that influence me. Also, classical composers. Um, that all kind of melts together into mm -hmm. kind of me in, mm -hmm. in a way. But a lot of the the uh, contemporary um, music that influenced me is uh, w when I was about 16 years old, I went to Mario Rivera's house, who lived in 80-something, very famous uh, saxophonist. He used to play with like Tito Puente and a bunch of people. And he he was actually like like an avid, uh, you know, uh, student of of jazz. You know, and you know he he saw me and he threw, he 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 thought that I was kind of going for some stuff. And he recommended me this book by Nikolai Slonimsky. It's called Melodic um, The Source of Scales and Melodic Patterns. Hmm. And that book kind of changed my my outlook completely on music because it everything has to do with interv intervals and, and essentially it's, it's at the source of how to get from from one note to the next right for, like every every possible way that you could that you could go through the book is thick you know it's and it's a, it's a, it has a lot of different interesting names that he comes up with for stuff and sometimes he'll come up with like a passage that's like oh um, Ravel uses this in this piece you know and it's it's really it's really interesting the way the way right. it's kind of like a way of of um of going from one place uh, the, all the different variations that you can you know down a second up a third up a up mm -hmm. a fourth and then on the trite and the same thing it's very technical it's a super technical book but I've always found that that book to be um to be a very uh, nurturing kind of book for me because it kind of really helped me structure my 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 music. Uh, and you know, also you put all the other experiences that you that you have because if you use, use, just use the book, it could sound very robotic, you know. Right. Because it's, it's it's literally a dictionary. It's like if you if you made a book of of just the words in the dictionary, huh. it wouldn't be very fun. <laughs> but you seem to also have some dance forms. Yeah. In that first piece. Yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, right. I mean, I imagine it's. Yeah, like um, m most of my music, even the improvisation, all has clave in it. Even, right. Even okay. when I don't want to. You know, it's just it's just something that's. I know it sounds like a cliche, but it really isn't. You know, it's really like you. You know, the my my background. You know, where I come from is is very prominent in, in my music, and I think that makes it kind of even more interesting when I, when I include some contemporary classical things yep. with the Cuban thing. It just sounds kind of outrageous. That sounds great to me. Yeah, thank you. It sounds fantastic, and going from one note to another. That's the king. That's the game, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, all the, all the, you know, if, if, you, if you're a composer, it's like it starts like splitting up the, the scale in two, then in three, then in, in three you have the augmented sound, and on four you have the diminished sound, and then it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it has all these patterns that just go from, from um, it's, it's essentially just every way to get from one note to, like, in, in like, a, like, a, like, a, like an octave or... But then it's too active. your aesthetic result, though, doesn't sound um, technical, right. which is you know, right. The fact that you it's have not mechanical it, at this all. is all informing you, but the the result sounds much more like a sort of a, a fantasy. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, <clears throat> but what I found is that it really, it it really takes off the barriers of 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 kind of like. Um, conventional harmony and conventional melodic ideas and essentially there's really no wrong notes as long as you could justify the notes somehow intervallically or or mor morally or whatever you know like 
uh, if it's in the key or not, or intervallically, you could also justify anything. Like there's really, it's really hard to play a wrong note if you if you have purpose and if you know that what you're doing and and you're playing that note with purpose. It will never really sound that wrong. Mm -hmm. I could play some ridiculous stuff that that if you know how to resolve it, right. then it doesn't sound wrong. Right. It only right. sounds wrong if you don't know how to resolve it. And right. You kind of let it hang in there, and you you, you get the deer in the headlights. You know. Yeah. Oh, what's happening? <laughs> Where do I go now? <laughs> Well, going from um, your composing to uh, applying that and playing out, um, you've been playing out, uh, I understand, the past few months, which has been a big change in the world yeah. for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and as things have opened up a bit this summer, uh, and you've been all over the place, uh, I know. Um, so what has the response been? I'm curious. Because uh, um, as, as, as a performer, do you feel safe? Do you feel if the audience feels safe? Do you like the vibe and, and the room? Uh, what's it What's it been like for you playing out? Man, I, th I think people have been really uh, appreciative of music coming back. So it's been it's been great. You know, sometimes you know, sometimes it's light because naturally a lot of the venues can have as many tables as they did before. Even though now I think it's coming back to a more you know, normal, uh, which I hope is okay. But um, it's, I mean, it's, I think people are appreci appreciative of, of having arts back in their lives. You know, like we really take for granted all the stuff that we had before, which yeah. was normal stuff. You know, going out to, di to dinner, going out to, to see a, a show, going out to see, you know, just stuff that, that you know, we, we didn't think much of it. At least I didn't think much of it. You know, you just get up, you go, you go down to Smalls or to... Yeah. Whatever, hang out. Yeah. All night, and I mean, then, but then that became a thing that was not that was not possible. Yeah, I mean, we we I think we don't we underestimate how much culture is a part of our lives right. and how and how it, even the, even in the small ways, not just attending an event, yeah. but all, what, how it surrounds us and makes up the very vibe of New York City, which I mm -hmm. had to say, musicians play a very big part in. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and, there's, and you also have the the economic aspect of it. I mean, for, for me, fortunately, it, it wasn't as bad as for a lot of my friends, because on in 2019 I got this. Um, it's called the Guggenheim Fellowship, which is a, a very, very, very nice chunk of of money. Congratulations! So to, oh, thank you. Yeah. It was supposed to be for two years. So the first year of the pandemic, they really didn't want me to do anything other than write music. So that's kind of, you know. It, that, it wasn't it wasn't my plan to begin with, but it ended up being serendipity. Yes, that's the right word. And then the second year, you know, this this year things things started kind of moving the spring a little bit, a little bit more, and and now it's it's not like it was before because I was touring quite a bit before the pandemic. But right. but you know, just doing local gigs and you know, just hanging out with friends and it's just it's nice. It's nice to have some of that back. Has this has this time off, so to speak? Um, given you a chance to indulge in certain types of compositional forms that you may not have at other times. What, I mean, one thing that we've noticed with some of our guests that, along with all the bad stuff that we can go on at length about the past year and a half, um, in some ways it's given, it's provided an opportunity with some of the downtime. Mm -hmm to maybe revisit some things artistically that one may not have otherwise? Is there any? Mm. Or, I mean, I, mm. One thing that I can remember is that when, when the pandemic, um, when, when everything kind of shut down, uh, I was in Australia uh, doing, doing a tour, and then we had to come back to the States. And at first, you know, I was very like, man, what, you know, damn, what, what's going to happen now? Uh, the, the summer got completely wiped out, and mm -hmm. then shortly after, the fall got completely wiped, wiped out. So I, I, this doesn't really answer your question, but but I embarked I embarked in this challenge that I put put myself, where it was a, I call it a composition a day challenge, where I wrote a new piece every day, and I recorded it at my house. I have a studio home. That answers directly. <laughs> right? I mean, in a way, that wouldn't have happened. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. And how, how long did the challenge last for? <laughs> That's yeah. a good follow-up. Is it still going on? No, it's not going on. <laughs> but, but it lasted about 45 days. Wow. And, um, okay. and at first I was doing it on my own, you know, just recording stuff at home. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, well, 
this completely answered your question. Then I was like, well, you know, how about if I just do some video? You know, I have, I have very nice equipment, you know, like Sony stuff, you know, high-end video gear that I never really used. So I was like, let me just use this stuff and see what happens. So I started making these videos. And then, you know, some very well-known musician friends that I have that were like, oh, man, we want to we wanna play some more U-Tunes. So we started doing all this, like, um, you know, like collective video right recordings i mean it wasn't live live streaming but like they would yeah. send me their feed and their right. audio and i'll put it together and that kind of pushed me to to get into really into final Cut pro video editing uh-huh so that that does answer your question even though yeah. it's not musically but i did it, it pushed me to to learn a lot more about about other other art forms and right you know and i have a lot of videographer friends so i would ask them about you know right. uh um, what do you call the I don't know, like fading fading it and out stuff? Right, right. Was was good? Was not good? Right. You know, I would show them my stuff. They would tell me, oh no, you know, you're putting just go from one one camera one camera to the next. You don't have to put a, a fade on it. You know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that, yeah I know you're talking about exactly <laughs> <laughs> all too well. You know, what's what's cool? What's not cool? What's right. pro? What's not pro? Yeah. yeah, but I think there's a beauty in that too, though. Yeah. Where you know, I think everyone kind of said. Everyone just do the best you can during 2020, right. <laughs> and you and you and obviously you didn't go to school for video editing no. or anything like that, and you know you're doing the best you can. And uh, I think it's fantastic that you've been able to expand yeah. your talent right. into into video. And I guess it, it kind of dovetails into a question I have of that. You know, a lot of li people did do live streaming and were doing like I don't know um, PayPal and whatever for or to. Venmo me for playing X Y Z on my Facebook channel. Blah blah blah. Um, what's your thoughts on um, mus musician streaming and you know and you know as we get as we go back into live, hopefully more live. Um, I have kind of a feeling it's here to stay. Do you? Um, and also, do you? But but obviously, it's it's harder when you're not a go getter like you who can do it yourself. Um, so I'm curious if you feel like this if this component of creating videos trying to monetize perhaps or not depending on what you're trying to accomplish like you're trying to expose people to a new song of yours maybe or trying to get a record deal for someone else or there's a lot of different reasons why people would want to do things mm -hmm. uh perhaps it's just to find new collaborators i'm just curious your thoughts on streaming and video production and this new kind of well I, I, i'm gonna i'm gonna knock on wood and say post pandemic age here because I'm hoping we're all being smart and everybody getting vaccinated. So I just wanted to hear your answer to that, if you could. Um, man, I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't love the live streaming thing. Yeah. Um, I love I love producing videos, and you know, you get like even if it's in different people's houses or whatever, they record, they bring it to me, and I put it together. I like. That. I think live. I don't know. I li live stream. I think people just started doing too much of it. You know, it, it just, it was at first, it was, it was like, it was like teaching, you know, like uh, when the pandemic hit, everybody was a teacher. Right. <laughs> yeah. And they came from being like, you know, like a couple of people, you know, you know, teach here and there, a couple of my friends teach here too. All my friends now are being teachers and they kind of like floss the market and, you know, it's just like, you know, then, then, you know, it's, and, and I understand that people, you know, people have their struggles and economic thing and, right. and. I mean, I, I can't, I can't, I can't begrudge him for doing it, but it, it doesn't really. If everybody starts doing the same thing, it kind of loses mm. its. its uh, right. Well, I don't know if I've ever. Let me answer your question. I never have, but as a, I have some decent stable of um, students, ranging from seven to I don't know, forty-three, I think, right now. You know, and just sort of as a logistical aside one thing that i can think of off the top of my head ex an extra musical aspect of all this is that when i've had little recitals friends and family from every continent have been able to watch mm -hmm. their friends and relatives play some of whom had never even seen them play so that's just an example that wouldn't have happened right and some of the students and family have been like, oh, it's been so great that grandma so-and-so, you know, in Spain was able yeah. to watch their grandson. And, you know, now I've gotten, you know, minimally up to speed on those sort of things. And that I intend to keep doing. 
there's no, no that, reason, that, you know, so cool. that that's one thing I can think I mean, of. The, the, <clears> there were a couple of venue, venues that before the pandemic, they were doing that already. And I, and I, I thought it was always really cool to just kind of go and check out some, like Smalls had, was doing it before also. This is and then Jazz at Lincoln Center were doing a lot of streaming before the pandemic, mm-hmm. and I, you know, I think it, it, I think it has to be. I think it, the combination of the live streaming and the crowd is cool. It's just mm. the the live streams that I've done, and, and I, I don't really enjoy it that much. I haven't done that much. The ones that I've done, I have been with clubs that are closed and just want to do a live stream and with right. like that. And that's okay. That's cool. I, right. I don't mind that, but. No, the whole thing at the house, you know. Wow. People yeah. seeing your curtains, oh. you know. Don't let the, don't let the color in your bathroom. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like stopping your table, messy. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, um, but I, I don't knock anybody for doing it, though. Right. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, just a quick question going back to what Jonathan asked you a little bit earlier about your, um, your writing. And also, I want to tie in the Guggenheim thing as well because it's great. Um, so... What are your plans coming up with, um, like, you have all this wealth of material uh, that to be recorded. And so I'm just curious of, like, what your plans with the Guggenheim, and is that separate than your new Cuban Express band? Um, like, just curious, and your trios. So, like, I'm curious, you have, of all this wealth of material, the Guggenheim, I'm curious of what, what, your, what your grand plan is coming out in year two and three here. Yeah, for the Guggenheim, the Guggenheim is kind of past, but I did, um, I wrote, like, bunch of um big band music like 30 something charts and and we rec- we did a we did two records uh one of them came out last year and it was uh the record is based on a on a song cycle that i wrote based on the poetry of this great cuban poet by the name of jose marti who's like a like an icon of latin american struggle and all the stuff from the 1800s and uh, he lived briefly in new york in the from 1880 to like 1890 or something like that, and uh, he wrote this, probably his most his most well known uh, work, which is called um, um, "Versos Sencillos," simple verses, and it's like this poetry about Cuba and about you know forlorn and about longing for his return, and and it, it's very it's very broad. His his topics are very broad from from religion to patriotism to war to death to life, you know, friends. So just to be clear, there's no vocals. There are. There oh, are there vocals. are. Okay, I thought maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was a. Um, it's a big band plus plus two singers. Okay. Uh, singers are two of my favorite singers in New York City. Uh, one of them is Camila Mesa. Okay. From Chile, and the other one is Sofia Rey, from Argentina. Mm. And that was the Guggenheim project, and mm. ended up being two records. We, we recorded a lot of music, and the uh, in the pandemic, the music that I wrote, we're actually gonna do a record later this month uh, with the new Cuban Express, where I'll record a lot of the tunes that I wrote um, during that challenge. Challenge so the forty-five. Yeah, and I, okay. we, we've been playing every Sunday at this uh, small uh, place in Queens called Terraza Seven. And it's been kind of like a rehearsal, like we we've been playing all summer long. So you know we've been playing the music that we're gonna record. That's oh, exciting. We'll have to get you to play it uptown somewhere. Yeah, you course. know we'll have to figure it out. That'll be great. So, um, what are you gonna play for us next? I think I'll improvise something else. Sounds great to me. Let's hear more from Manuel Valera. Thank you. 
Wow, that was really wonderful. Thank you. Amazing. Good stuff. Um, Manuel, we could listen to you play all day, and hopefully we will sometime. Uh, but in lieu of you playing a full concert here for us, where <laughs> can we send our listeners to experience more of your music? Um, well, you could get some of my recordings. I have a Bandcamp page, uh, Apple Music, Spotify, all that good stuff. I mean, Bank, Bandcamp is the is the best for musicians, so okay, you can support me there. There you go. Um, we can also follow me on my Instagram, and I'll put where I'm playing, and come check it out. Okay. Great. Sounds good. Well, listeners, you have your instructions. Go forth <laughs> and buy and listen. Uh, and, you know, it's just really wonderful um, to be able to hear you play today. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for here. being here. You bet. So... You're here on In What Artworks On Air. It's live and local. It's where we meet the musicians um, and artists of all stripes who make their home here in Upper Manhattan. If you have a moment, please show us some love right now on your social media and also review this on Apple Podcasts. It really does help. Uh, thanks to Hudson View Gardens for hosting us and to HyattSites.com for local uptown promotional support. Feel free to head to inwoodartworks.nyc. And keep up with all that we do, including the Inwood Film Festival, Filmworks Al Fresco, public galleries, live performances, and so much more. And feel free to make a tax-free donation to us at inwoodartworks.nyc backslash donate. This program is, is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council. And in part by a grant from the New York City and Company Foundation with partial support from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. From the top of Manhattan and the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Aaron Sims. I'm Jonathan Bell. For Inwood Artworks On Air.